Hello, welcome to Rappler Talk. I'm Marites Vitug and joining us is Bob Herrer Lim of Teneo, a global CEO consulting firm. Bob has been watching Southeast Asia for, uh, for many years and we will talk to him about the reopening of Southeast Asian countries post the lockdown. So hi, Bob. Thank you for joining us and making time for this interview. Thank you, Marites. Always a pleasure. I know that you've, you've been really monitoring uh, a number of Southeast Asian countries. So tell us, how are these countries navigating the new normal? I mean, like Thailand, uh, Vietnam, or Singapore, or Malaysia, broadly. Just uh, maybe walk us through this, some of these countries. Yeah, Marites, that's a great topic because I think, you know, considering how new the virus is, it's important that we learn from each other as countries. No, no single country has the expertise, right? So uh, given your question, I think there are a few things we've been learning. The first is, uh, you know, early contact tracing and testing are very important, not just, you know, when we for the past few months, but going forward. Because that is how we will not only be able to know what's happening, but how we will reassure the public that as they go on with their lives, that they are safe. And that is important because if people do not feel safe, they will not engage in activities. They'll not go to theaters. They'll not watch movies. They won't congregate. And, you know, that, that's not only a social issue. That's an economic issue as well. So it's the, I think the first thing that we've learned is it's very important to get a grasp on how the virus is performing or what is happening in the country in real time. And that's one of our problems, as you very well know. Our data is late. We're not sure how quickly we are accumulating new data. So the first thing we've learned from other countries is you have to get a grip on how the virus is progressing or not progressing in your country. Because but, that not only... Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. Because that not only builds confidence with your citizens, it allows other countries or even within countries, uh, regions to be confident about each other. So right now, if you're going to, let's say, Sorsogon, or if you're going to Iloilo, they'll be very suspicious of you as a Manileño because what if you have the virus and that impedes tourism, that impedes uh, commerce? And I think that's one of the lessons we've learned now. Insofar as opening, therefore, what's happening is that countries are staggering their openings. They're starting with low-risk activities first, going out shopping, uh, industrial production, etc. Then they're moving to the middle phases in some countries. Uh, the more advanced ones are obviously Vietnam and I would say Thailand, where they are allowing a bit more of economic activity. In terms of Malaysia, they are going to allow religious activities uh, in the very near future. So there's a staggering, and it depends a lot on their confidence that they know what is happening. And unfortunately, that is one thing we're not very strong at right now. So really, Vietnam is the most advanced in terms of reopening. Uh, because they have had zero debt. So that gives them the confidence. And it seems that Singapore is already also, uh, is it already in the phase where they have opened restaurants, right? And, and barbers and, uh, I mean, sectors which have like contact with people. Yes, in many of these countries, like in Singapore and in Thailand, their main concern right now is important transmission from foreign workers coming in because like Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore import a lot of workers for construction. Uh, and in the case of Malaysia and Thailand, agriculture and manufacturing. So what happens is they're monitoring this, but internally within their own communities, they feel a bit more secure that, you know, a Thai who goes to a movie house is probably not going to get it as long as they practice safe uh, social distancing and they wearing masks. I think we as a country are still a little bit behind that in terms of, of that level of confidence. Now, as you mentioned, Vietnam is the most advanced. They, they, basically, they, they basically got out of the what you might call the fear phase about a month ago. So for them, again, it's the people coming from abroad and the sporadic transmission, but it's not sustained community transmission. They're not seeing that anymore. And that's why they're more confident as to what they're opening up. So schools have opened up in Vietnam. Factories have opened up in Vietnam. They're progressing towards, let's say, a more normal way of life, if you want to call it that. So there seems to be, in the Philippines, there seems to be a contradiction here. They say stay at home, but they're reopening, you know, some businesses. Uh, maybe that's 
uh, also because we're in a difficult situation. So is, is there really a contradiction or uh, is there a balancing act going on here? Yes, it, it's between the devil and the deep blue sea, right? <laughs> so the devil is you're afraid the virus is still out there and you might get infected. The deep blue sea is there is economic pain. And that economic pain, unfortunately, is hitting the lower income groups, the poor disproportionately, people who have no savings, who don't have the access to alternative jobs online, etc. It's going to hit the kids who go to school among the poorer communities even worse. And that for us is a big concern because if kids suffer because they can't go to school or if the quality of education is lower, that leads to longer term inequality. So you're just propagating the problem even more. So yes, you are right. We are caught between these two problems. And let's call a spade a spade. The reason the government and even we are not confident about what's happening out there is our testing and contact tracing does not inspire confidence. You know, we're still behind a lot. Uh, but at the same time, we can't neglect, you know, to, cer to a certain extent, Conception is right. You cannot neglect uh, the, the economic pain that our people, that small businesses are suffering. So all these things, I think, are adding together and causing these problems. And that's the challenge for the Philippines. We're caught between these two difficult, very difficult problems. Bob, you talked about the economic pain. It's not just the Philippines which will uh, undergo recession or contracting of the economy. It's also other Southeast Asian countries. What is the impact of a recession on, on our politics? And also uh, other countries will be having their elections. I think Malaysia or Singapore. Anyway, maybe you can start first with the Philippines and uh, compare it with some of our neighbors. The effect of recession on the country's politics. Okay, so the recession is inevitable for a lot of countries. Uh, you know, some will suffer worse than others. Unfortunately, it looks like we will suffer more than others because our exit is not as, shall we say, uh, it's not a V-shaped exit. We're exiting more slowly compared to other countries like Indonesia and Thailand. Th Th Thailand already has a goal. By July 1, they hope to remove most restrictions on social economic activities. We're not even having that discussion here, right? In Jakarta, they've already set out a weekly program for uh, moving out of their quarantine. So in many of these places, there are already expectations that they will move out. I, and you know, one of the challenges in the Philippines right now is I don't think we have that roadmap in front of us, right? What's going to happen next? So the first thing is we will probably recover slowly. And that leads to the question, what happens you know, to politics when you have recessions in a country. And recessions are very disruptive, especially considering how deep this will be, because it will likely increase disenchantment with the government. Now, the question is, what scale does this happen, right? You know, we, 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 you, you were, I don't know if you were in Asia in the 1990s, right? The Philippines did not suffer as much. We did not suffer as much, uh, shall we say, social pain. You know, we wouldn't see revolt in the streets. But in countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, you saw uh, ethnic or even religious or race-based divisions showing up, right? There was a lot of attacks against the ethnic Chinese in Indonesia. It was one of the, the most difficult, you know, periods in their history. In Malaysia, they're also worried about that. Uh, in Thailand, it wasn't like that, but it was partly the recession that allowed a populist like Thaksin to come into power. So now you, the, the big question for us is if, let's say, six months from now, the recession, you know, we're probably on our way out of it, but it's led to a lot of economic difficulties. What will people look for in a leader? How will they look at the president? Will they say, you know, the president is focused on law and order, but we're hungry. That's the issue right now. And therefore, the people become more vulnerable to populism, to nationalism, saying, you know, uh, we should, you know, raise social welfare payments, we should subsidize, etc. All these kinds of what you might call populist economic prescriptions. And ultimately, do they become more vulnerable to a populist in 2022 when we have elections? Somebody who says, you know what, we mismanaged the, econo the economy after the pandemic. This is what we need to do. And those are real risks. We cannot disregard them because, you know, if, if somebody had told you in early 1997 that you would see race riots in Indonesia, people have said, yeah, that's a risk, but we don't know if it will happen. It happened. We saw race riots in Indonesia. So right now, given how deep the economic pain, we cannot disregard all these social risks that are going to arise from it. 
But uh, our president in the Philippines is already a, a populist leader. And as we've seen in the last weeks, you know how he has responded. He has never mentioned contact tracing, never mentioned treatment, mentioned testing once. But a lot of times it's social amelioration, helping the poor, uh, you know, paying the families of the deceased, but never budgets for uh, key strategies in um, treating or in beating COVID-19. So you're saying that recession may most likely lead to people again voting for a populist leader. Oh, we already okay. have one. <laughs> I, I, I think President Duterte is partially populist, but I think a large part, well, we might debate that, a large part of his patro popul uh, politics is patronage driven, which is partially populist. But, but it's really, we can provide for you and that's what we do. The problem is he only understands one aspect of this dynamic, that part, the, the patronage driven populism. But there are also different aspects of populism insofar as they relate to control of the economy, in terms of how they relate to the role of the state in the economy. So I think that the, the problem is President Duterte is a populist insofar as the patronage and law and order aspect of it is concerned, right? The government will take care of you. But at the same time, economic policy is being driven strongly by Secretary Dominguez. And the Secretary Dominguez has said, we're not going to go into some large, uh, what do you call that? Uh, uh, yes. Large new stimulus program. We've seen that because they are worried about the, the effects on the budget or the effects on our fiscal stability. So I think there is some more room that for a populist, a different kind, somebody who caters to the economic fears, not just the security fears of the people, to come forward and say, you know what, this government mismanaged the whole post-pandemic economic response. I know what to do, and this is what we must do. Now, the challenge, sorry to belabor the point, is globalization, you know, the liberal economic consensus, that's also not a strong message today, right? No one is saying, oh, to solve the crisis, we must liberalize, we must globalize, we must make uh, industries more efficient, etc. So it's almost like there are two, there, there is that outer boundary. So there is space for a populist within that, within that sphere to come forward and propound himself in 2022. And as we've seen in Philippine elections, the real, you know, the real horses, the ones who are running and have a serious chance only emerge or become real contenders six months to eight months before the actual elections. And that's so, what's going to increase the uncertainty. So in the Philippines, does this give the opposition a huge opening? As you said, six to eight months before the elections in 2022. Maybe that's, uh, things will shape up. But at the moment, now during the crisis, uh, we've seen how government has responded um, not effectively. So does this give the opposition an opening? Yes, it gives the opposition an opening. The big question is, will the opposition be able to take advantage of that opening? Okay. The challenge with the Philippine opposition is, one, uh, they are fragmented. Uh, they are also very highly personalistic uh, in that it depends on, you know, Le Lilia de Li uh, Leila de Lima, you know, asserting herself. It depends on almost individual politicians asserting their own platforms. There is little sense that the opposition itself is acting as a coordinated alternative to the Duterte administration, right? The, the opposition presenting itself as saying, we're not only people who oppose the administration, but we have a different platform that will uh, address your different concerns. You know, you see that in a lot of parliamentary systems, right? Where there is a shadow government that basically criticizes uh, what the government in power does. So the challenge in the Philippines is, yes, the opposition may have valid points against some of the things that the president is doing, but they, are, they have so far been able to take the next step, which is to present themselves as an alternative model, as an alternative you know, power structure for governance in the country. And I think that for them is the big challenge. And I don't see them solving that anytime soon. Earlier, you spoke about the 
social instability brought by the Asian financial crisis in 1997-1998, and the Philippines was not really that affected. But now, uh, are you comparing the instability that will arise from this pandemic? Are you saying there will be more instability after this pandemic here in the Philippines and maybe also in in other countries in uh, surrounding us? I think the message that we have is we should be very careful about how this pandemic or how the economic effects of the pandemic filter their way through society. We are going to see probably the low, the, the growth of the Philippines in negative territory at its lowest level since the 1980s under Marcos. Okay, in Marcos, we had negative 7% economic growth. Right now, we might see the range, you know, the, the projects are anywhere from minus three to minus eight. So we're in that zone where the pain could be very acute. Now, the other big problem of, for us is, uh, if you watch the news, the Arab states, the Gulf states have already said, they are going to reduce the number of expatriate workers in their systems. So we might have structural issues, not just related to the pandemic, but people coming home who have been earning money for years working abroad. Uh, although, you know, the healthcare system has been elevated by this pandemic if you take a look many hospitals in the west are losing money so uh, there are structural challenges to our overseas workforce so i think are we sure that we will see instability that we saw in the 1990s no that's not assured a lot depends on what happens but in terms of the economic hit that our economies are going to take it is going to be very severe it can be very severe and therefore, the social effects can also be very severe if not managed properly. And when people are angry, it's really difficult to predict how they will react, right? If you take a look at the Arab Spring, you know, how could you predict that a Tunisian vendor setting himself on fire would basically spark a whole, you know, economic and political upheaval across those countries? How could you have predicted that a bank defaulting in Thailand in the early 1997s would would have or mid 1997 would have eventually led to a cascading economic crisis that would lead to riots in Indonesia and the fear of social unrest in Malaysia you know, and you know the fight between Mahathir and Anwar. So uh, the economic, shall we say, the economic, the potential eco political and social outcomes are very wide whenever you see deep economic pain. And also recently, there's been talk about um, American companies leaving China because of uh, the trade war and also the fear of just being dependent on China for uh, supplies. So they're leaving and they're going, they're transferring to Indonesia and to Vietnam. And so far, have their company, have this, any of these companies uh, signify their intention to come to the Philippines because that's also one of the worries that we are not growing our foreign direct investment and, and, and we are in an economic crisis. So we are losing out, are we? Yes, unfortunately, we are on the lower end of the priority scale for companies that are relocating out of China. Now, one thing is uh, U.S. companies will not leave China wholesale. It's not like they will pack up and go. Many of them will seek to diversify their production system. So let's say if they have one billion, they were thinking of one billion dollars investment into China, they'll probably say, let's allocate a certain amount of that to another place, just so that we will have some kind of insurance. It's what we're saying is companies will go to just in case instead of just in time. In the past, it was just in time. They would produce in China because that was the most efficient way of doing it economically. They'll now be more concerned with having excess capacity somewhere else. So now the challenge for the Philippines is that historically, we have not been good at attracting foreign direct investment. And there has been a lot of papers written about it. It ranges from everything from our inability, you know, it ranges from everything from corruption to weakness in the bureaucracy to flip-flopping industrial policy, which you can then tie to patronage politics and the fact that the economic and political elites uh, compete for power. So there are all these, shall we say, reasons for it. And I think if you're a Western F investor now looking at the Philippines and you're looking at Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, 
uh, in fact, I was talking to, I had been talking to one American and he said no one ever got fired for deciding to relocate to Thailand because it's a safe bet. Okay, because you can't be blamed because every almost every Western manufacturer is there, from the large automakers to the semiconductor assemblers and every and the white goods manufacturers. So you can't really say you're making a wrong bet, but making a wrong bet on an Indonesia and the Philippines can be detrimental to someone's career in the West. Uh, so I think the challenge for <clears throat> the Philippines is to say we have moved out of that phase, and the problem is. I don't think anyone is looking at the Philippines right now believing that we have moved out of that phase. Now, I know that like Secretary Dominguez and Carl Chua have this uh, belief that we should restructure the incentive system. Now, our view is if you want to do it, do it quickly, do it transparently, and put it in place so that it is predictable and foreign investors will know that the regime will not change. The problem right now, they said they will do it by June. Congress adjourned in June with not only without the new bill, with the incentives bill, but also without a stimulus program. They prioritized the anti-terror bill and uh, something else. Even the 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 Bayanihan Hilas one was not uh, extended. So right now, the perception that we are managing the economic effects of this pandemic, we are at the lower end of that scale as well. So Thailand just approved last week a $58 billion stimulus program. Uh, Indonesia is $47 billion. Vietnam, I haven't seen the latest figures, but they're not going to suffer as much. So for them, the, the size of the stimulus program is not as urgent. Malaysia is also approving a large stimulus program. We have a small stimulus program. The government is relying on build, 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 but build, build, build is a slow gestation process. It's not like tomorrow the subway will be you know, be built at 100% capacity in terms of hiring lots of workers. The, it will pay off, but it will pay off in the near, longer term. Our challenge is the economic need is most urgent in the next six to nine months. So you mean uh, among our neighbors, you mentioned that they have passed already stimulus packages. We haven't, and we're still going to wait for Congress to convene in July for that. Or can the executive realign the budget and already uh, uh, come up with a stimulus package or it, it has to wait for Congress? At, at that size, it has to wait for Congress. Okay, so the, the problem is right now our spending will be what spending will be. Uh, so we are betting or hoping that people will restart economic activity soon. The challenge is people can't even get on public transport. People are not sure if they are safe. So even in Metro Manila, you will see that the uptick in economic activity is slow. People in the provinces cannot go to Manila. Manileños who would like to go to vacation in the provinces find all these cumbersome rules in terms of uh, you know, the health permits, etc., the home quarantine. So our recovery is going to be slow from this pandemic. Uh, and that's the challenge for us. I think that is the short-term challenge, and I can't emphasize it enough. The long-term challenge is uh, I'm, in fact, I'm very disappointed about our decision not to go allow kids back to school, okay? Because that is the one of the best ways to address inequality. And if you take a look at the lowest income levels, the, the you know the half of the population, they will not have access to the internet in a sustainable way, to the ability to print material in a sustainable way. That's just going to worsen inequality over the longer term if we insist on that. So apparently, now that countries are reopening, I think all of us already in Southeast Asia are in different phases of reopening. We may be considered, the Philippines may be considered one of the later ones, right? Because are we on the same level as Indonesia? Because Indonesia and the Philippines are both, uh, have the most number of cases, have the highest fatality rates. So are we on the same track as Indonesia? Yes, we are both uh, paddling the same boat, unfortunately. <laughs> so Indonesia has many far same problems. Testing capacity is not at the level that they would need or want. Uh, contact tracing is also not at that level. Uh, the, the opening up is very fragmented. Uh, so different, different local regions are doing what they want. So the challenge is, let's look out two to three months from now. So Singapore will allow Vietnamese in. Vietnamese will allow Singaporeans in. So they'll have that 
uh, commerce and tourism between the two of them. Vietnam will allow Japanese in. Japanese will allow Vietnamese in. Then they look at the Philippines and Indonesia and they'll say, you're still 250, <laughs> 300 cases every day. We're not sure how fast are you contact tracing, etc. How strong is your testing regime? So they're going to ask more questions instead of making it easy for us. And I think that is the challenge for us. We're not seeing this problem. And the, again, the challenge is, it's not just what's happening in us. Over the next few months, more OFWs will start coming in from the Gulf, from Europe, from the US, from these other countries. And our ability to process them and make sure that we don't have important transmission is also going to be a very important aspect of managing the pandemic. And right now, that's even a challenge, right? You're hearing all these reports of somebody being cleared in Manila, then coming to the provinces, then being tested and found positive. Now, the problem is we don't know if they've been found positive based on a PCR test or an antibody test. Because if they've been found positive on an antibody test, that's a different, there's a different way of managing that. But again, it's this going to be this continuous churn. And it's one of the things I think that the government has to look at. We face serious structural issues for the next three to six months that go beyond simply people going back to work in the factories or in the malls. Yeah, actually, one last point, Bob, it really caught my interest, is travel bubble. Like, Singapore is already, as you said, talking to China, or I think some cities in China, they'll start to allow international travel. But of course, that's not in the radar yet of the Philippines. No, That travel bubble will be limited to countries which have successfully managed COVID-19. So again, in that area, in tourism and travel will also be uh, left behind. So, But do you see, when can we have our own travel bubble? <laughs> I think we have to convince other countries that we are managing this properly, that we are not only able to track the cases as they come uh, and test people as needed, but we have a real, really secure way. Uh, you know, it might not be a 100% complete analogy, but we're dealing with risk here, basically, right? And you're familiar with terrorism, uh, Marites. So terrorism, countries that were seen as, you know, as sources of terrorists were isolated, right? They were, uh, the security processes were higher for their airports. They were given much more scrutiny, etc. You've seen that. Now, think of the virus in the same way as something that causes fear for these countries. Because Singapore, the last thing Singapore wants is, you know, uh, Filipino helpers coming in and spreading it within their communities. So they need to be assured that that's happening. But that's also the last thing the Japanese want, okay? Or Vietnamese seeing our tourists. So thinking of it that way, they will then impose likely more restrictions on Filipino travelers. To the extent the Filipino travelers might not might say, it's not worth it. I'm not going to do 20 things while a Thai traveler only needs to do three things, okay? Uh, so that is very important for us. The problem is, I think, given how in many countries their biggest concern is imported transmission, not so much community transmission anymore, that they might say, Philippines, you're on number five in terms of countries. We will fix this. We're first going to work it out with Vietnam, Thailand, Japan, Singapore, the Korea, Taiwan, the countries that have been able basically to, to, to deal with the virus in a credible way. And this goes back to the core issues that we've been debating in the Philippines, the ability of the DOH, the, uh, the, the government seeing the problem, not just as a tomorrow problem, but as a problem with consequences three months down the road. Well, on that note, Bob, it's not so bright, huh, our future. But anyway, on that note, there's a lot, to, a lot of challenges facing our leaders here in the Philippines. And of course, there are lessons to learn from other our neighbors. And, and I mean, I'm sure I'm, that the Philippine government is aware of how our neighbors have been uh, containing the virus. So thank you very much, Bob, for sharing your insights. And we hope we can talk again at a better time uh, for the okay. country. <laughs> thank you. And also Always to our pleasure, viewers, yes, and to our viewers and listeners, we will uh, continue conversations with other uh, resource persons on containing the pandemic as well as other related issues. Okay, thanks again, Bob. See you See virtually you in the future. <laughs> Bye.